Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be and whenever you may be listening to this podcast. This is Marketing in the Raw and I am Adam Helway. I am the host and I am so glad that you joined me here. Thank you for spending the time listening to this show. I don't know about you, but I am a little addicted to marketing technology. I love testing tools. I love using tools. I love finding the solutions to problems that I have through having these tools available. Um, and every year the tools get more and more sophisticated. Um, the thing that I notice a lot is, um, is, is how overwhelming it is though, for the average person. Um, some of our clients, for instance, just it's too much to try to keep their finger on the pulse of all of the potential solutions that are available and going on. And then ultimately, even in adopting those tools, um, it's one thing for one person to jump in and utilize a tool. But when you're trying to get an entire organization to use a tool or insert it into the workflow of whatever it is that you're doing to try to, uh, um, to, to, to get people to use it uh, and make it a part of a, of a process that you've maybe already had long established, it can be pretty challenging. And, um, you know, that, that bears the question, how many tools is too many tools? Well, you've come to the right place. I am talking with the chief MarTech himself, Scott Brinker. He is the VP of platform ecosystem at HubSpot. He helps HubSpot play well with the ocean of uh, marketing technology tools that are out there. He is the founder of the, the blog, chiefmartech.com. Uh, he holds an event every year uh, on, I think, both coasts uh, called the MarTech Conference, right? Straightforward. And uh, he is the producer of an annual infographic that shows the vast ocean of marketing technology that's available at any given year. So just to give you an idea, there's 8,000 different tools that are listed on that infographic in 2020, and that's a growth of 16% from 2019 to 20 uh, to 2020. So uh, I am super excited to have a conversation with him, and we get to ask him how many tools are, are too many tools. Uh, I invited one of my best friends and fellow marketer on the podcast to co-host with me. His name is Steve Farnsworth. He asked some intelligent, awesome questions. I knew that he had some stuff that he was itching to ask because he and I always go to the MarTech conference ourselves to check out the floor and see what solutions are out there and talk directly to the vendors. And usually on a week to week basis, we're sort of competing to see who could find the best solution for a particular problem between our clients and, uh, and other things. So uh, I'm super glad that Steve was able to join us without any further delay. Here's the interview with Scott Brinker. Scott Brinker, I'm so glad to uh, to have you joining us. Um, and uh, you know, as I was sort of telling you just before we started, I, I've always been a little bit of a little bit envious of of your uh, your position and your work. You you do so many things, and they're all related to to understanding and testing and 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 really kind of pioneering the mapping out of marketing technology, which when you first started, if anybody's familiar with the infographic that you uh, created that sort of showed the ecosystem, I don't know how many years ago it was that you started and it, and it, you know, a few logos here and a few logos there all sort of categorized into the different sections. And now there are so many logos on that, that you've updated every single year. You can barely even see what's, what's on there. Um, Tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and, and, and really what inspired you to initially double down on marketing technology from not just, you know, somebody who was, who, who enjoyed it and wanted to use it. Um, uh, uh, but, but certainly somebody who now has been completely associated in a number of different roles with sort of being the curator of the ecosystem and uh, evangelizing that with folks. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Adam. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, fun, fun topics. Um, so I guess I, I could set the stage by saying I, I basically wear two hats in the industry. Uh, professionally, I was the co-founder and CTO of a marketing technology company myself called Ion Interactive uh, that made a platform, a SaaS platform for interactive content. 
Uh, that company was acquired a couple years ago, and after it got acquired, I then joined another company, HubSpot, uh, here in Boston as their VP of Platform Ecosystem. Uh, and my role at HubSpot is really about helping all these other MarTech and sales tech companies be able to integrate uh, with the HubSpot platform and to help them be more successful within our ecosystem. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I've had this bizarre fascination with the collision between the worlds of technology and marketing for many, many years. Um, so the other hat I wear is for the past 11 years, I've been writing the blog, chiefmartech.com. Uh, about five years ago, we started a conference called MarTech uh, around that community. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, part of that was uh, this uh, accidental creation of this crazy infographic of, um, yeah, my, my, my attempts uh, to scope out uh, all the different marketing technology vendors in the world. And uh, boy, every year I try and every year I fail miserably. There's <laughs> more MarTech out there than uh, you can put on, put on a single page. Yeah, it sounds like you're going to start going from creating an infographic to you'll have to do a mural next time, right? When you go into into inbound or, or one of the conferences where they feature that, we'll just see this big wall with all of these logos all over the place. Um, you know, I, I, I in looking at your background, you, you obviously have uh, quite a, a technical background before you ever started sort of jumping into this. Um, you, you've got a couple of computer science degrees and you also you know have it have an MBA um, what would you sort of say to, to those out there that, um, I mean, like, I, I think it comes naturally to really enjoy the technology side of, of business, let alone marketing, because of having that tech savviness, um, uh, in, in your DNA, I feel very much akin to that as well, but we run into it quite often where you've got folks who just don't really understand the technology side of things. What, what would you, um, what would you say to those folks that that might look at this and say, well, just MarTech is just fun, shiny toys for, for folks that really enjoy um, technology, but it's it's not really a necessity for, for us as, as marketers? Yeah, well, it is fun, shiny toys, but uh, yes, it's, it's much more than that as well. You know, it's really interesting. I mean, I can, I can empathize with where people are coming from on this because, I mean, if, if you go back not too long ago, right? The world of engineering, software engineering, IT, technical careers, like for a high school guidance counselor, that was on like one end of the spectrum, you know, and going into marketing would have been like a completely on the opposite yeah, end of yeah. the spectrum. Um, and it has been fascinating to me to see these two worlds collide because to be honest, it's happening in both directions, uh, you know, so I write a lot about, um, you know, how technology has steadily just infiltrated uh, the profession of marketing and how marketers do their jobs in a digital world. But if it makes you feel any better, or if it makes uh, a uh, non-technology marketer feel any better, the same thing's been happening in the other direction too. I mean, like uh, software developers, uh, classically where the folks are like, we hate marketing. You know, but now you look at software developers, right? They're all publishing projects as open source. They're, you know, engaging in these communities. They're speaking at conferences. Actually, some of the best marketers I know are these like diehard engineers. So it's um, uh, the, the, the two worlds are colliding. I think the, the, what you want to keep in mind about technology is the, this, the often said phrase is, you know, it's just a tool. It's often said a little bit dismissively that way, like, oh, you know, that's just a tool. But it's like, okay, look at anything in the world. I mean, look at your house. Yes. How is it built? Well, uh, there were tools involved. And you can look at a hammer and you can look at a saw and you can say, oh, well, those are just tools. Well, yeah, but you try building a house without a hammer and saw and good luck with that. You know, and I think when you look at it that way, you start to realize, okay, all these technologies that we have for engaging with people in the digital world, um, I mean, they're really essential, but what you don't want to lose fact of is on their own, they won't do the marketing for you. Turns out that, sorry, marketing automation doesn't mean marketing just automatically works beautifully. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if only that were true. Um, you know, but it's like using these tools in the right way lets you create experiences in this digital medium that quite frankly, I mean, like brands are building 
you know, millions of dollars, billions of dollars in some case uh, around these capabilities and these new customer experiences. And if you're wantonly ignoring that, you know, as a marketer, you do so at your own peril. I was just going to say, it reminds me a little bit of, of, of a newness factor, right? Because as you were describing like a screwdriver and a hammer and all those things as being tools and, and in business, things like email at one point were sort of bleeding edge and, and, and a fax and a cell phone and mobile devices and those sorts of things. But those things have become sort of par for course. And now like marketing in general has continued to, to move at such a steady, fast pace that there's always something that feels a little bit new and therefore also marketing technology over the last, I'd say, you know, eight years especially has um, just exploded with all these new tools. And so it, I think a, a certain element of this has to do with the, the newness of things that eventually will become again par for the course, just like those other things that I discussed. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think, you know, to those who are skeptics, uh, and again, I have a lot of empathy for, uh, you know, a non-technical marketer who looks at this stuff skeptically. I think you can bring the right mindset to MarTech, which is you can bring the mindset of what is this going to do for the customer experience? What is this going to do for the efficiency of my business? Those are absolutely the right questions to ask. What you don't want to do is say, oh, I don't have any interest in any of those things. You know, what I'm trying to do is like, how do I bring the perspective of how this really impacts our brand um, as, yeah, the, the decision question for what, what can we take advantage of? How can we use it well? You know, one of the things that, uh, that I'm seeing an awful lot when we meet with companies and, and just saw uh, is, see it constantly, which is like you go in and talk to these folks, and I, th I see a couple things happening, talking to traditional marketers, which is pretty much everybody really still. And, and, and marketing has always gotten short shrift from the founders of most startups. They, they, they'll pay full price for engin engineers, but not, you know, they don't think about doing marketing until they're ready to launch two weeks out, right? And so there's, this, there's still this mentality, and while they got away with that in past years, um, we're saying people now who are trying to throw money at solutions to make marketing work is the marketing's not, they don't really have a marketing person yet. They're all engineers and they're throwing money at it and they're going, did we had somebody tell us this? Two people tell us last week with a straight face, digital does not work in our marketplace. And, and, and they're doing a super complex piece of software. And, and it's that kind of mentality. And so one of the things we're saying is that that kind of disconnect by strategies about trying to like, uh, think they can just do marketing on the side without specialists. But the other part of that equation is, is marketers are still have this mentality who maybe they, they learned uh, marketing back when it was a dark art and now it's kind of technology, but they still, they still are not technologists. And so they're still going out and hiring technologists who may have marketing in their experience or the title, but they're still technologists and in the, in the transfer strategy the transfer of strategy from the C level to the implementation level, especially the MarTech stack, is not happening. And I constantly see this as, a, as, a, as a, an issue, and I'm kind of curious for you to talk about what you've seen on that front, and maybe some, do you see anybody uh, with a solution, do you see that toward that? Because it doesn't seem like a problem that has a good solution yet. Yeah, no, I think you've uh, nailed it. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting is for all the expansion that has happened in the field of marketing, all these new technologies, all these new kinds of channels, all these new tactics. Um, I mean, right, it's, it's, it is truly mind boggling. Uh, I mean, even like the scope, the degree to which, you know, I, I guess for a while, you know, there were the occasional nods that marketing should, you know, take some responsibility for customer experience. But for the most part, right, they're kind of off on there. So you guys handle the comms and, you know, you know the advertising program. Maybe we'll let you have a bit of saying in the pricing or segmentation, you know, but like, you know, the broader customer experience, that's something else. But in a lot of companies now, increasingly marketing has this responsibility for customer experience, at least as the champion, if not the coordinator of it. Um, but so for all these ways in which marketing is expanded, the thing that's fascinating to me is all of the traditional responsibilities of marketing, none of those went away. You know, I mean, this thing of understanding the customer and how do we create a strategy and where do we get product market fit? Um, I mean, this is with, without those fundamentals, everything else that you layer on top of it just becomes, uh, what's the Shakespeare sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, and so I think you're right, you know, if you've got organizations where one person maybe understands the strategy and sort of the larger, you know, product market vision, and then 
disconnected from that are people implementing, you know, digital technologies and touch points. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, the stuff that falls in the middle of, in that gap um, is, yeah, where all the <laughs> all the real work is. And so, I, I don't think there's a magic bullet to it. I think the the companies that I've seen that do this well, they usually do it well for one of two reasons. Either one, you're increasingly starting to see a new breed of CMO that has some experience uh, with this technology. It sort of grew up from the digital side of the house. Uh, and so they're comfortable incorporating that into their overarching strategy. If you don't have that, because I admit those are still, they're emerging, but you know, they're-, they're How far, they're few between. Few and far between, and they're incredibly high demand. Um, you know, the other way is again, to get a CMO that recognizes this is important and is able to bring someone onto their team who is that head of marketing operations and marketing technology, and that they're able to work as that bridge uh, between the strategy and the actual operational side of it. These people are hard to find too, but they're, there's more of them. Um, and I think this is also something from a, uh, you know, agency perspective, from a services provider perspective, you're seeing companies that are also as an external relationship are helping companies, uh, uh, helping senior marketers understand how to fit these pieces together. But you've got to have that conversation. This is like, okay, every month we're like, you know, adjusting the alignment between the strategy of marketing uh, and its operational capabilities. Well, let me, so let me ask you, so, so this is, so I have an agenda kind of where I'm asking about this. So <laughs> kind of a, a, a piece of this. So like, I would say like the numbers I've seen, like I've seen a couple studies, I'm, I, and this is really me more asking you, you probably have some better data or seen a couple studies that when they were looking at this one study I saw when they were looking at agencies and how much, how much of the features that they had implemented versus for the MarTech stack, it was someplace around like 33% of functionality was leveraged or something to that effect. Does that track, and that, that kind of tracks with my real world, world experience. I go and talk to them and go, Hey, do you have all your digital plumbing connect? And they go, yes, we do. And we look and no, they don't. And, and it's, and, and that's really, it's, it's constant, it's consistent. It's not once in a while or sometimes it's a lot, like 98% of the time people don't really have their digital house in order. So is it, first of all, two part, I guess, are you seeing that, that kind of track with your, like when you look at uh, MarTech stacks and how much they're really leveraging, are you seeing that same kind of not really leveraging the stack or using a small sliver of it? Yeah. So I think there are, two things you mentioned there that are really interesting. One is the question of integration, which is, okay, I've got a bunch of these tools, but wow, are they actually connected together? Um, and this has been a huge problem. Um, I would say trend-wise, it's getting better, and it's getting better for a few different reasons. It's getting better because, first of all, the major marketing platforms for years basically resisted this idea of ecosystems. They essentially wanted to just say, hey, listen, we'll, we'll build it all ourselves. All you need to do is buy everything from me and you're done. Um, you know, and so they kind of resisted you know, what was happening in my crazy MarTech landscape. They're like, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. <laughs> um, you know, but a couple years ago, I think they finally realized, I mean, pretty much all of them, that they weren't going to outpace this. Uh, and so they really did do a 180 and say, okay, listen, we will open up our APIs. We're going to create these programs for developers and technology partners. Uh, and now pretty much every major platform, I mean, Salesforce, Marketo, Adobe, Oracle, HubSpot, you know, um, all have now these collections of integrations that are increasingly plug and play, you know, I mean, again, your mileage varies from one particular app to another, but the responsibility is on the platform provider and the app creator to, we should be able to figure out a way to get these things to connect instead of always forcing the poor marketer to figure it out from scratch on their own. So we're making progress. We got a long ways to go, but you know, uh, that's getting better. Um, I think the separate thing you brought up though about utilization is interesting to me because I've, I've basically competing opinions on that. Um, so to me, what matters is, are you using your MarTech capabilities that you have effectively, where effectively is the actual impact on customers is positive uh, and the actual impact on your business is positive. And if you're able to do that and you're only using 33% of the potential features in your stack, 
frankly, I don't care. I mean, you know, it's it, part of the challenge is so many of these MarTech stacks, they have so many features, they have so many possible things you can do. And for any one business, it's not always clear that the majority of those features are relevant, you know, to what you need at this point in time. Or again, like, even if they could be relevant, would you be able to use it well? You know, that if I actually tried to use that, would I, I just make a total mess of it? Uh, and so I think that's where you like, you want to say the, the question to me is a little less about utilization, uh, and more about sort of the, uh, the trajectory of, are we making incremental improvements in customer experience and business performance? Um, well, the, the, the other, the other side of that equation is, is the, the value gap it's it, when it comes to utilization, right? So whether or not somebody's utilizing how much of, of the particular tool, as Steve was saying, we run into that a lot, whether it's our clients or whether it's our, our, ourselves looking at a tool and going, we're spending this much per month. We'd really like to allocate some money over to this other tool that's doing this other thing, but that other tool has one sliver of functionality that we'd really love. And, and unfortunately we can't peel that off and, and only pay for that. We've got to pay for everything. And so it becomes a, a thing of, not necessarily having one tool that does everything you need or having tools, honestly, where you, you're going to use every single thing that they, that they offer. Um, but I think a lot of folks also run into this, this value gap thing where um, they buy a tool initially understanding what they believe to be the value that they'll get out of it. But then because they don't utilize it even at 30%, which would be an appropriate amount for them to, to really squeeze the value out of that, they potentially, um, poo-poo the tool or, or, or sort of go, you know, this isn't providing the value for us. And so um, there's a lot related to, I think, adoption there and being able to take not just those tech savvy marketers and getting them on board and going, oh, that's really, really awesome. I mean, I think Steve will attest to, to me being the guy that just sort of my eyes light up like a little Japanese animation character as I'm seeing these tools. But when it comes to like bringing them to the team and saying, are we all going to utilize this? Is this going to be something where I'm, I'm using it or I'm, I'm enjoying learning about it for one of our clients or something like that? Or are we going to more broadly use it and how much of it are we going to use before it ends up feeling like we've wasted a number of, of, of months of, of a subscription to pay for it or even the time that it takes to, to, to implement it? Have you found the value gap issue sometimes in, in folks when it comes to like, they, they're too busy, uh, uh, either they're, they're unable to get the non techie folks to adopt it. And therefore the, the whole rollout fails or, um, or just in general, they don't, they underestimate how complex it may be to initially get things up and running and sort of abandon it before they've been able to be successful with it. Uh, yes, <laughs> in one word. Um, yeah, I mean, you phrased it as a value gap. I might humbly suggest it, it feels like a, you know, a very common anti-pattern here is really it's an adoption gap. Um, you know, it's not that the tool isn't capable of actually delivering uh, the capabilities that were promised. But again, it, it's, it's not marketing automation that does it itself. You know, it really does require a, a human uh, someone's got to be wielding that hammer and saw, you know, to get the big, beautiful beach house. Um, so I think <sighs> there's a fellow, Avinash Kaushik, uh, who's like a Google Analytics. Yeah, he's, list. yeah. Yeah, right. He's been around yeah. for ages. Uh, really a brilliant fellow. And he said something like 15 years ago that was his 90-10 rule. He said, you know, companies should invest 10% in the tools and 90% in the people. Uh, and he said it in the context of analytics. To me, this is broadly applicable across all of MarTech. Um, you know, that uh, getting these tools, yes, it's, it's great. But if when you're acquiring a tool, you're not mentally preparing to say, okay, purchasing this tool was probably about 10% of the work. 90% of the work now is going to be figuring out how do we teach our organization to really use this effectively. Spot on. Um, yeah. And people totally underestimate that. Uh, and it is, I think, the absolute biggest reason why this value gap, adoption gap, uh, is so large. Well, let me, so I, I, I would agree with your earlier analysis about if it's 30%, fine, but is it the right 30% or is it really a thing? I would say that any one of us who would look at any MarTech stack, by and large, and I mean like really like most of them, like 90% higher, 
we would look at and go, they are not using the level of functionality that they could be using and then should be using for really solid block and tackle best practice, not fancy stuff. But right now, they're not even at a standard, because yeah, a standard best practice. Would you say that that's true? Yes, and I think part of why, uh, yeah, so this is, this is where you and I uh, have different um, experiences is an unfortunate problem I have is because, you know, with things like the MarTech conference and, you know, right on the MarTech blog, having this chat with you guys, I tend to talk with a lot of people who are on the leading edge of where this <laughs> stuff is going and people, they do this for a living and they're really good at it. Uh, and it's so easy for me to fall in the trap of like, oh, well, of course, this is common knowledge. This is how you run a, you know, the best in breed, you know, marketing automation platform. But the truth is, yeah, the vast, vast majority of the world, you know, I mean, even the concept of what do you mean by marketing automation and, you know, wait, so I could just blast these emails, you know, <laughs> 10 times a week and say, you know, um, it's like we've got a long way to go. And again, it's, it's kind of just that if you take that adoption gap, value gap problem and you multiply it by the millions of businesses out there in the world who are still just trying to make their way along that maturity curve. It's huge, uh, and I think it, it is a failure of the industry to not have been doing enough to help uh, move that vast majority of businesses further along this maturity curve faster. You have, in the past, you've done, uh, you've done a presentation, if I, if I recall correctly, on um, uh, agile marketing. Is that right? Yes, yeah, like, uh, favorite topic, yes. <laughs> so in, in back to this gap and the amount of the level of feature features or uh, the way that they're, they're strategically applying their technology, where I think we all agree there is still a break. There's still a break. Do you see either like through mar agile marketing or maybe more specifically like uh, objectives and key results type wording, OKR type mentality as a way to bridge that gap between senior management's intention and the, and the technologists and the people in the trenches actually executing. Do you think that something like that's the right solution or do you see, do you see something else that might help bridge that gap given what you've been doing? Yeah, so I think um, absolutely if you aren't mapping these things back to some sort of metric, uh, you know, measurement program, um, you've got problems because, yeah, it's just, you know, no senior executive outside of marketing, in some cases even in marketing, is going to try and understand the nuance of the technology. What they want to know, and in all fairness, they're right, is what is the actual impact this is happening on our business? Uh, I think where things get tricky is, you know, the technology is changing so fast, customer expectations are changing so fast, is that I do think it's important for marketing organizations to have a portion of their work be experimental. Part of it is, you know, having to sort of, you know, test uh, how changing technologies and changing expectations are going to impact their business. Um, and those experimental things typically have the failure rates that, you know, any experiment does. So you hopefully you're keeping that in a bucket. That's one of the ways I think this ties back to the agile mindset. Um, but for the vast majority of your work, right, the 75, 80%, 90% of it, Really, it should all be, you know, mapping back uh, to metrics. Ideally, you know, actual customer revenue, you know, some cases in B2B businesses, they just have such long sales cycles that you need some sort of uh, uh, proxy metrics in the middle. But yeah, I mean, everything needs to be to that. And then when you're deploying a marketing technology or you're deploying a set of a new tactic or strategy with that technology, it should be like, okay, here's our baseline on what these markets, uh, you know, metrics were. Here's the implementation. Here's what we expected. Here's what we saw in the first 90 days. Here's what we saw, you know, six months later. Um, and there's some proof right there. There's some proof in the pudding. Exactly. Right there. You know, and, and again, it doesn't have to be super, super fancy, but, you know, you have to you have to put an analytical layer on top of this. Well, we, we talked a bit about um, sort of selecting, you know, selecting a tour, tool is, is only part of it. And then obviously the adoption aspect of it as well. And, and, and I think that um, whether it's marketing or otherwise, the adoption of technology is um, these days synonymous with the buzzword of digital market, excuse me, digital transformation, right? 
Um, and, uh, and digital transformation covers a lot of things. But in talking with a couple uh, of, of my, my friends and, and, and experts in different fields, um, their opinion is, is that one of the, thing that get, the things that gets left behind when it comes to people thinking of digital transformation and, and getting behind it and going, yeah, we're going to buy these tools and we're going to put them in place and it's going to transform and innovate the way that we do things is, is forgetting about actually transforming the processes that are tied back to the use cases re, re, around those tools. How important do you feel that is in, in making, uh, you know, uh, adopting a, a, a tool that we're talking about um, successful ultimately? Yeah, no, uh, incredibly. That's like the 90-10 the uh, balance to me because it's, I'm trying to think of it. It's almost like, you know, you went out and you bought a Ferrari because you got really tired of like, you know, walking to the market back and forth every day. So you bought this really cool Ferrari. <laughs> and what you do is every morning you get up and you push the Ferrari to the store to get your stuff and then push it. It's just, I mean, you've got to change the process. You've got to change the way in which you actually leverage this stuff. And kind of like a startup buying Marketo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to throw rocks at anyone, but it's like, I mean, you know, it, it really comes down to the fact that change is hard. Um, and I think in digital transformation, in MarTech adoption, all this stuff, the systematic failure is just not recognizing that the adoption of the tool is going to require organizational, behavioral, mental model changes. Um, and if you don't prepare yourself for that and invest in it and manage it that way, there's a, there's a phrase that's been getting some popularity lately that I really love. Um, you know, uh, so we've heard great for years about sales enablement. Marketing understands that. Like, oh, yeah, these are all the materials I'm going to empower salespeople, you know, to sell our solution. That's great. You know, this, this rise of the phrase marketing enablement, which at first you're like, wait, what? Um, is all about this concept of saying having these internal groups that are focused on providing the education and the materials and the process for teaching the organization how to take advantage of all these new marketing capabilities. Um, I've seen a few companies, in fact, we got a couple coming to um, uh, MarTech here in Boston in September, uh, that uh, like one of them is the head of marketing enablement for Red Hat, you know, and like all this group does is focus on how do they help enable the rest of the organization to take advantage of these capabilities. I mean, to me, that's the sort of commitment uh, that you got to be looking at if you really want to, you know, get the value out of these tools you're buying. Well, speaking of, uh, of that, thinking about the skills gap that we were sort of alluding to, you know, regarding folks that may be a little bit more technically inclined and, and, and others that aren't, with the pace of the way that things are, are, are changing, um, how can marketers stay relevant and reduce that skills gap? I mean, there's not, there's not a bunch of college programs for, for folks right now to like utilize all these different MarTech tools per se. I mean, maybe at some point there'll be some sort of foundational elements of obviously things like analytics are, can translate a little bit from tool to tool and that sort of thing. But, but for those that are, that are listening and, and thinking about how to make sure that they can still stay relevant in their, in their job, because kind of what we're saying, the, the subtext to all this is, is, is MarTech is technology is a part of a lot of things we do these days, let alone marketing, but it's an, it's a critical part now of, of, of marketing and you can, it's be very difficult for somebody to compete without, without adopting, you know, uh, some understanding of it in some way. And, you know, and, and you may be a standout in your organization if you're able to really get, get your teeth into it and, and uh, utilize it in a big way. So how do how do marketers stay relevant? How do they stay abreast of what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the right question to ask. I think, first of all, take a deep breath and understand there's so much changing in the world at this point that it is impossible for any one person to keep up with all of it. Um, I mean, I'll be like, I love this stuff. I live and breathe it, you know, 24 seven. I can't keep up with it all. Like every week I'm like, wow, I didn't know that was possible. I never heard about that thing. That's cool. It'll probably come up somewhere in this conversation. You'll mention something I'm like, really, we can do that. Um, so, I mean, we just, we live in a world where, you know, for better and worse, there's just so much technological change and innovation happening that's impossible to keep up with all of it. And as soon as you come to that recognition, you can take sort of a deep breath and say, okay, it's not my mission to keep up with all of it. 
what what I want to do is try and keep up with uh, you know pieces I find that seem particularly relevant to my business you know and what's relevant you know part of it's just keeping your ear to the ground of your customers you know looking for the way in which prospects and customers are changing their be buying behaviors the expectations that they're changing I and mean, if you talk with them and every good marketer should be talking with these constituencies you know on a monthly basis you'll start to see you know the those things coming up so that's one part of it the second part is out just frankly allocating time you know, I mean, there's many ways you can do this, right? You can talk to your peers. You can, hey, you go to conferences like MarTech. I'll plug that one more time, um, right? You, there's so much content on the web, uh, you know, uh, you can read. I mean, there's, there's no lack of places you can go to get educational content on this stuff. But I think starting where you first said makes it a ton of sense. I really love that answer because it's very similar to like we work with with clients and I've done, we've done executive trainings on analytics and things like that uh, in the past. And one of the first things we talk about is not how to use the tool, but how to understand that amongst even something like Google Analytics that just has tons and tons of, of data out there that really what you need to be focusing on is what matters most to you, what matters most to driving your objectives, to your type of business, uh, all, all those sorts of things. And so um, for those out there that that look at the sea of, of options, they should be treating it in a very similar way. Like what matters most to them and their industry or, or potentially the, the industry they'd like to get in if they're looking to get hired someplace, you know, uh, or something like that. That's one way to sort of by process of elimination, narrowing down um, what they pay attention to. And then from there, I think, like you said, then then going a bit deeper into educating themselves on uh, on, uh, on on the tools or what, what's available out there. Right. Yeah, I uh, completely agree with you on that. Um, we talked a bit about the the potential shortfall of how the industry is is helping to support um, marketers out there and understanding certain things about the tool, possibly or or, or the vendors and, and such. What role do agency play agencies play in um, sort of helping to keep people up to speed uh, and their their clients and 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 other folks? Because what we find is. Over the years, there's been an, a, definitely an increase in a courting of the agency from from vendors, and uh, to a point where many of them have almost only agency relationships versus client relationships, and they're 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 wanting to enable uh, us as an agency to um, to manage that client relationship, but to support us. So it becomes an extended part of the team where in the past we just have a tool, we just have some software, and now we sort of have a team that's trying to provide uh, um, a, a scaffolding of resources around whatever their particular tool is supposed to help solve the use case that helps enable the agency to be that, that bridge. What are your thoughts on the role the agency plays? Yeah. Wow, man. This is a whole podcast episode unto itself. Um, it's like uh, the, the Dickens phrase comes to mind, you know, it's the best of times, the worst of times, <laughs> <laughs> depending on the agency. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful time or a terrible one. Um, I think the thing is, maybe in an ideal world, uh, companies would be able to hire the right talent and allocate the right uh, change management, you know, for how they adopt these things and they plan it out and they'd stay on pace and it would all just work beautifully. It's, it's a wonderful vision. Um, and the reality of that is <laughs> we're nowhere near that. Um, and unfortunately for a lot of companies, while they can like, you know, look at a path and they can say, okay, well, yeah, maybe over the next five years, we'll develop that capability in house. Um, if they don't move today, they're not going to be around in five years. And there is only one way to solve this is you need to find a services provider, an agency partner uh, who can basically give you the shortcut uh, that they can say, listen, actually, we can even do this for you. First step is let's get things working because you're losing business. You know, you're delivering terrible experiences. You know, we got to stop the bleeding, you know. I think what makes a really great agency is, you know, and this is perhaps different than, you know, classic agency worldview, is they really do see themselves as a deep operational partner uh, with the client, you know, and so part of it is, you know, not treating what they do as a black box, you know, but very much treating it as a transparent box that, you know, they're working with that company on developing these capabilities because ultimately when it comes to customer experience from an end-to-end -end perspective, 
it's impossible to outsource that 100%, right? You know, the, the company has to take ownership, you know, of this. So finding these agencies that are really good at that relationship of providing these capabilities and providing the training, you know, and finding the right ways to combine what they can provide as a service with what they need to educate and train their clients to be able to execute inside their own organization. I mean, again, if you're good at this, you are golden. That's, <laughs> that's a wonderful thing. But um, yeah, I, I, I think just like there's a lot of companies that are struggling to master uh, MarTech internally, um, there's still a lot of agencies that are struggling how to incorporate this into their services offering. It, it just from from a market. So one of the things that's interesting is, is it's, it's easy. It's one of the things we see a lot is is traditional marketers are yet baffled pretty easily as soon as you start throwing around a lot of jargon and technical terms and stuff like that. And so what happens a lot of times is they will meet with an agency and they go, "Yeah, we do that. Oh, we do that. We got we got it covered. Yeah, we got that." And, and they don't. And and so if is there a from from a client side perspective, is there a question if you were interviewing somebody who said, I'll, "I'll take care of your martech," and I understand martech, I'm really good at this element of MarTech. Are there questions that you would ask as a general kind of role to kind of see, not you're looking just to see how they answer the question, see if they understood what they were talking about? Yeah, I think I'd start with uh, your question about the value gap, the adoption gap. Like explain to me how you're going to get us over that gap. Uh, because I think if the agency has a good answer for that, it's clear that they're not just treating it as a set of tools. They are thinking about the adoption and the integration. I don't mean just the, the technical data layer integration, but the actual process and strategic integration. Yeah. Um, so I, I've got one one last question to ask you, and I wanted to thank Steve um, for, for joining us uh, uh, because, uh, again, this is something that he and I talk about a lot, and we sit on a couple different sides of the spectrum just because he's always asking some really good questions about the practicality of you know what we're going to implement and, and stuff within the agency, and I'm the one that's looking at the shiny object and really wanting to to you know um, to kick the tires and as well as obviously implement it, but I really do find a, a lot of fun and value in seeing how everything thing works and, and plugs in together and, and the sort of possibilities. I've got one super, like, this is the pinnacle of all questions that we've asked so far. So, you know, don't let it intimidate you at all, Scott. Uh, and I'm <laughs> only asking, faith, I need to some screw up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm only asking for a friend, but how many tools are too many tools? Oh, wow. That is a great question. Um, you know, the problem with that question is the same problem I have with the landscape, which is where are you going to draw the line on what is a tool, right? Like, like is every app that uh, a marketer or salesperson has on their mobile phone, is that a tool? Why or why not? Uh, if you're running a WordPress site, how many plugins uh, do you have? Uh, how many plugins is too many plugins? I mean, it's... <sighs> The, the challenge is, is so much of this technology, you know, we're getting smaller and smaller pieces um, that it, hopefully with these ecosystems, you know, work uh, together more, more and more seamlessly. But also so much of it becomes ambient, you know, so much of it becomes, you know, personal productivity tools that then connect with the other things we're doing. And, and this is all wonderful. It's great. But it's like somewhere along the line, it becomes hard to, to count. Um, so I think I might try and dodge the question a little bit by saying, you know, too much technology is where the technology is getting in the way of you delivering results for your business. Then I you've got it. too damn much technology. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, um, Steve and I have always found a lot of value. The last couple of years, we've gone to the MarTech conference here in, in uh, San Jose and in fact, um, what we end up doing often is at a minimum run the, 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 the floor, the expo floor. And uh, it gives us some really incredible opportunities to not only see what's new. I mean, from year to year, uh, the, the, the breadth of what's out there actually changes quite a bit. And so it's always an interesting representation of what's going on within the industry. Um, but additionally, we get face to face with folks that sometimes we've seen in the past and we've overlooked them and not really been able to have a deep conversation about their product. And then we ended up like the first year, I think at least walking away and completely, you know, adopting a, a new tool for, for our project management and, and, uh, and, and internal communications in a big way uh, after having been 
for almost 10 years with, with another tool because we were able to have a, a really good conversation directly with, with those vendors. Um, and so I really recommend that people check that out. I know um, hopefully we'll be able to, to get this episode up um, before the Boston event, but you guys have the Boston event every single year. Um, and for those, I think that are interested in learning more between the events themselves and um, sort of, I think the ecosystem as a whole, I think we probably recommend going to chiefmartech.com. Would you agree? I will have plenty of content for you there, I promise. <laughs> it, it, great discussions going on over there. And Scott, I'm telling you, uh, I tried very, very hard not to geek out and, and go off the, the rails on, uh, on all the fun geeky stuff. And I super appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, guys. Love this conversation. Great stuff. I love, I love, I love that you finished the episode. I super appreciate that you spent your time with us. You could have been in so many other places. Maybe you were avoiding those other places, and that why, that's why you spent time with us. At any rate, I hope the time was well spent. And uh, if, if you could do one thing for us, it would be incredible if you could subscribe to the podcast. And if you've already done that, first, I'd love to give you a hug when I see you next. And second, if you would then instead rate and review the podcast, it helps us get discovered. It helps others that are interested in the topics find us. And uh, all the way around, it is super appreciated. If you'd like to connect with us for any reason, you'd like to connect with me directly and ask me some questions about marketing or uh, maybe suggest a topic for an episode that we should be talking about, uh, go ahead and email me at adam, A-D-A-M, at secretsushi.com. Or just generally check us out at secretsushi.com to see what we're up to. All right, take care.